Welcome, deer hunters, managers, and enthusiasts. This is Deer University, the podcast of the Mississippi State University Deer Lab. My name is Bronson Strickland. And I'm Steve Damaris. Bronson and I are professors of wildlife management and co-directors of the MSU Deer Lab. Together, we've researched deer across the United States for more than 40 years. In our podcasts, we explain the why and how of deer management based on science. Whether it's research we've conducted or explaining research done elsewhere, we'll offer you a college course in the science of deer management. But don't let Steve scare you. This isn't going to be a review of calculus or chemistry. Instead, we take results of research, reduce it to what's important, and explain how you can apply research to management. So join us for this episode of Deer University. Okay, welcome back to the Deer University podcast. I have a treat for everyone today. I am on a work assignment in Maine, um, and I had the the pleasure of meeting retired, but not really retired, uh, formerly retired wildlife biologist and deer habitat management specialist Joe Wiley. And uh, we were working on a project to, together, a youth conservation activity, and I got to meet Joe, and we started talking about deer biology in Maine, contrasting it with Mississippi and the South, and I thought this would be just a wonderful opportunity for us to chat for a little bit and let people be exposed to issues and deer biology in Maine. So, Joe, if you don't mind, before we jump into deer, if you don't mind, give people just a little bit of your background and what you've done the past 20, 30 years in Maine. Okay, um, I started. I start. I went to the University of Maine and got a degree in wildlife, um, and started my career in the Adirondacks, uh, uh, mainly studying uh-huh. deer, deer habitat, and I've pretty much been a habitat specialist since then. Um, then I went to New Hampshire and was actually a deer biologist when I was in New Hampshire, southern part of the state, uh, ran part of the deer management program there for the southern half of the state. And then um, after that, I got my dream job in Maine, um, working for the then Bureau of Public Lands, which is the public lands manager in the state of Maine. I I, I should back up a little bit. I got a job with Fish and Wildlife, and the assignment was to be on the staff of the other agency, the Bureau of Public Lands, and now the Bureau of Parks and Lands. But um, so for the last 30 years, uh, I worked with a team of uh, 15 to 20 state foresters managing 600,000 acres of uh, state-owned land uh, managed for true multiple use, recreation, wildlife, uh, and and timber products. and you're able to keep everyone happy, right? Well, um, I tried, <laughs> but um, it was uh, I, I, it was sort of like being a missionary at the beginning. Uh, the fellow that created the position was my supervisor, and he was only in the position for a year and a half, and then and then I stepped into that position and and finished a lot of the stuff that he had started, but. Um, and in Maine, the deer habitat that we're most concerned with, of course, is winter habitat because uh, we can have up to six feet of snow in the northern part of the state on the level in the winter time. Our, our winters typically last. We get our first snow uh, sometime in November. Uh, the snow depths are restrictive for deer. Uh, can start in November, but usually by December. And then they last through to March, and some years they actually go into April, and that's an awful long time for the beer, the deer to be restricted on a, a low protein, low energy diet. Um, so they have some special adaptations, uh, which we call deer yarding, or the the term we like is deer wintering area. The deer concentrate on about 10% of their annual range in the winter time. And it's areas that are dominated by balsam fir, usually the spruces. We have red spruce, white spruce, um, cedar, northern white cedar, um, and hemlock, eastern hemlock. Um, And 
we do have hemlock woolly adelgid in the southern part of the state, which is impacting the winter shelter. But um, so, Joe, they, kind of g explain that a little bit more, because there's there's a lot of people in the south. They may have heard the term deer yard, but it, is the purpose of this for thermoregulation for cover or for food, or is it cover that's providing food? Absolutely, it's all about energy conservation for the deer because they can only carry so much food in the form of stored fat going into the winter. We assume that they all go into the winter in really good shape. Um, and they're usually okay regardless of the winter until January and it's after that that uh, the problems come in. So the deer gravitate to these areas. Um, the snow depths under these softwood stands because of the structure of the needles and the branches uh, are 40% less than in adjacent hardwoods. So there's less snow, so it takes less energy for them to walk through the snow. The other advantage is they, they yard in groups, uh, usually family groups. We think that the does, the, the female deer, teach, take the fawns. The fawns are still with them, so the fawns get imprinted on the traditional wintering area. And we've had some of these traditional wintering areas that, for one reason or another, got cut or burned or blown down and the, those deer will still come back. There's no shelter, the deers will still come back and somehow they might survive. They do not move. Everybody said, well, they just move to the next best available cover. And then in my experience, that doesn't really happen. It's like but, they're imprinted on that area and they're gonna return right, to that area. They're very traditional. So uh, if you have a declining deer population, like we've had in a good portion of the state over the last 10 or 15 years because of a lack of winter shelter and a series of severe winters. Um, you, you, you lose the animals that were imprinted to these areas. Some of the deer yards are still there and there haven't been deer in them for 10 years. Um, but you don't burn down the house. And in my analogy is you don't burn down the house just because nobody's living in it right now. <laughs> right, right. So, uh, and the other advantage is you've got a group of deer. My, my rule of thumb, and it's just that, is that in Maine, deer need, each deer needs about 10 acres of, of this winter shelter. And um, so if you're going to winter 100 deer, you know, you need, you need that big an acreage of winter shelter. The, the advantage of having numbers of deer is they develop trails, and some of these trails can be uh, a couple feet deep in the mm -hmm. snow. And they mm -hmm. maintain these trails throughout the interior of the deer yard to try and access food. It allows them to escape predators as well. Um, the softwood shelter intercepts the snow, um, and then the snow, some of it falls to the ground. Um, some of it melts and helps to change the structure of the snow underneath so it's more supporting to the deer. Uh, it's cold enough here that sometimes we have uh, real true powder snow and it's miserable to snowshoe in and I can't imagine a deer that most deer, even our big deer here, it's about 18 inches from the ground to the, mm -hmm. to the chest of a big buck. Um, so once the deer, once the snow depths get that deep, the deer are working really really hard to get through the snow so that and that's that, more about them conserving energy right even if and i can get some food i'm going to spend more energy to get what little food's available exactly and yeah. it's just uh, it's all all their adaptations the the fact that they've got hollow hair uh to insulate in the winter time they they get in these groups and also the softwood canopy uh on those really cold cold clear nights it helps to prevent the radiation mm -hmm. uh, and we always find beds multiple beds under the the tr the biggest trees with the biggest grounds we we know that that's where the deer are going to spend the night and they and they get much more active in the daytime because it's warmer and okay. usually try and uh, you know bed down at night whereas in the summertime it's pretty much the opposite here so regarding multiple use of these areas if uh, your your clientele wanted to grow the deer population. What habitat management would you recommend to, to grow the population and improve carrying capacity? I would, I would try and increase the percentage of uh, 
those four softwood species that I mentioned, spruce, fir, cedar, and hemlock, on as much of the range that was softwood, uh, you know, soil suited to growing softwood, which usually are the lousy, uh, on the low end of the drainage class. Uh, all our soils in Maine are uh, derived from granite, so they're pretty infertile. That's why everybody left Maine to go to the Midwest after the Civil War, because there was real soil. <laughs> you could grow plants but, a lot yeah. easier. Yeah. And, and we, we've done that on the public agency that I work for. You know, we just took a, a, a slow and easy approach and just pecked away at, at trying to nudge the stands towards more softwood where it was appropriate. We still need, we still need and want hardwood because that's what supplies the browse. Mm -hmm. Although cedar is a good winter browse. The, they'll eat fur, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's sort of a break-even food in terms of energy that they get out of it. it. It costs them almost as much energy. Hemlock's the same way. It takes them almost as much energy to digest it uh, as, as they get in mm -hmm. nutrition out of it. Um, spruce is not a browse at all, but the other three are eaten. And, then, and I, I read a study one time, and, and I've tried to apply it to Maine, that on the study was in, Anacostia Island mm -hmm. in Quebec mm -hmm. in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and it has a huge number of deer on that island. And there, uh, they calculated that 30% of the deer's winter diet was litter fall, which is yeah. just little branches that break off and land on the snow, and the deer walk along the trail. They just reach out, and they, they grab this one, they grab that one. Um, and uh, so... Uh, Let me contrast something, Joe, to make sure I understand. It sounds like to me that if you want to grow the deer population, you are more concerned about cover and browse, and cover that can serve as browse as well. In the South, as we were talking about earlier, which made me think, we got to get this uh, recorded here, <laughs> we focus on, so in, in our system, uh, it's all about sunlight and herbaceous plants. And so the way our forests, you know, we're getting a lot of rainfall, we've got a long growing season, is that we grow out of deer habitat within 10 years. Some places a little less, some places a little more, but if you went out and planted a forest or if you cleared a site and just let succession happen, you're going to go from annual plants to perennial plants to shrubs and trees and, you know, shade intolerant. And then, and then everything's up six foot high. And then the very canopy of your forest of that young 10 to 12 year old forest has now shaded out all of your herbaceous plants, which is the foundation, you know, that's 50% of their diet. When, when, when they have the option to eat forbs, they choose to eat forbs. So it sounds like that up here, it's your, your emphasis is less about uh, herbaceous plants and more about the enduring effect of these browse trees. Yeah, the, 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 the process is the same. I mean, you know, it's succession. Uh, it just takes a lot longer because we have a much shorter growing season in, in the northern. It, it varies from almost 200 days in the southern, very southern part of the state on the coast because of the ocean's influence to uh, some places 90 days in northern Maine. So it's a really short growing season. Um, but uh, the real bottleneck for our deer herd over most of the state is getting through that winter period from yeah. from January to April, basically. So. Um, so yeah, our focus has been on that. Uh, some individuals, uh, as an agency, we never worry too much about. Cre it's easy to create food, and we have active timber harvesting on all these parcels of public land. So that sort of creates the openings and the sunlight. And that was that was my job to try and strike that balance and and let the foresters do their thing. I'm I'm very. I've worked with foresters for 30 years and I'm pretty conversant and, and I don't have a degree, but I'm pretty conversant in forestry. So I would work with the foresters to try and integrate what I wanted to do for habitat enhancement into their regular silvicultural, what they were trying to do. And, mm -hmm. and, it, and it was, it was very, I thought it was very successful. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes, as I said, it's like being a missionary and, 
it was pretty gratifying, you know, 20 years into the career here. And I'd start hearing the stuff that I'd been preaching for 20 years coming back to me from the foresters. So so yeah. it, at that point, they got it. And the other thing about being in, in one place for 30 years is you could actually see the results of some of the early stuff that you did. And as I'm fond of telling people, I'd go out with the forester because he was getting ready to do a second entry in a stand that I'd been involved with 15 years previous. And we'd go out and we'd look and we'd look at each other and we'd say, let's not ever do this again. <laughs> or or we'd say, we got it hey, right. this turned out pretty good. Yeah. We should do a whole bunch of this, you know, mm -hmm. where we have stands that are like this and it would they'll respond the same way. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, the, the problem the problem with the whole deer angle is, is the habitat end. And unfortunately, trees live longer than most of us have careers. I had a 50 year career, um, pretty fortunate to have done that. But, you know, most of the shortest rotations for trees are 75 years. So um, wow. I did get to see the results of some of my some of my recommendations, uh, and, but um, you know, and and personnel change, and and people have different priorities. So yeah. you don't know what timber what, markets change, interests and, change, well, especially markets have such mm -hmm. a huge influence. I mean, you know, thirty years ago, you know, in the northern part of the state, we could only sell saw logs. Pulp was just not a product. Chips were not a product. So. Um, you know, we we had to live within those parameters mm -hmm. and harvest what we could and practice the best silviculture that we could. And then, as as things changed, we had a spruce budworm outbreak, which seriously impacted the winter cover of deer. That's what actually started the decline of the deer. the The spruce budworm destroyed, I forget, the ridiculous hundred hundred million cords of softwood trees wow. and some of them came back to softwood some of them came back to hardwood um, a lot of the deer guards were lost it was it was a huge basically it was a huge even aged over mature to over mature balsam fir forest just on a huge part of the central part of Maine not good most for people, deer <laughs> most people don't realize Maine's as big as the rest of New England it only has a million six hundred thousand people um, and it, it's at the the end of the pipeline so mm -hmm. um, all, we almost almost all of us heat with home heating oil we only recently the cities have received natural gas because a pipeline went through and um, so um, you know it's a uh, we, we face the same energy problems mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. wintertime, I guess, sometimes as the deer do. But So, uh, Joe, what are the your typical main hunter that's been hunting for five, ten years, not someone that's really new, but what are their expectations out of a deer season? And, and what is your deer season here in terms of, of length and weapon and so forth? Well, we have a whole bunch of them, like most states do, uh, the first, the first season starts around September 1st is the archery season, runs the whole month of September. We have some, where we have too many deer, which is in the coastal strip, because it's, it, the development is so heavy, everything is posted, uh, it's excellent deer habitat, and nobody can hunt them there because they're too close to a house. Okay. Um, and then, um, it actually it goes through October, the, the archery season does. And then, our firearm season is typically starts November first and runs till for many years runs till the last till the Saturday after Thanksgiving. Okay. Because we don't hunt Sundays in Maine. Okay. So it's it's basically a four week firearms season. And then after that there's another one in the north and two weeks in the south muzzle over season. Okay. Um, and I think the the average the average Maine deer hunter not the newbie but somebody that's around they want to see a deer mm -hmm. um, we have a uh, any deer antlerless deer permit system which is run by lottery um, and uh, we apply those in the areas that have an abundance of deer and we don't issue any in many areas of the state that don't have we feel don't have enough deer 
uh, we've recently come to the realization that maybe some of our uh, deer density uh, goals are a little too ambitious given the habitat. Mm -hmm. The habitat just can't support. Um, in the southern Maine, uh, our deer densities run roughly 20 deer per square mile, some, sometimes a little bit higher. In northern Maine, uh, they can be two or three deer wow. per square mile. So that that's tough country. But when you run into a deer, and, and in northern Maine, that low density, you, you may hunt a particular township and get into a whole bunch of deer and hunt other townships and never see a track. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the challenge up there. But when you do run into a deer, chances are only the tough can survive up there. Chances are it's going to be a 200-pound buck. We have the big 200-pound buck contest in Maine, and every year, I don't know, probably 15, 20, 30 people, maybe more than that, but those are the ones that actually get their deer weight certified by mm -hmm. somebody, and then they get a patch that they can wear, biggest main Biggest main bucks club, 2018. And it has nothing to do with antler size. It is only no. body weight. Right. Wow. Right. And and antler size in Maine, you know, because of our really crappy granitic-based soils, we don't have calcium. We don't mm -hmm. have good soils. So the deer really, they really have a tough time growing a really nice rack. And as you know, the rack size generally is is a is genetics. A function of age probably more than anything as well as nutrition, nutrition. so um, yeah we we have some nice deer and uh, but they're what's the typical how would you characterize the the buck age structure of the harvest so if if you were working a check station most of the bucks that come in to be checked are they going to be yearling bucks two yeah. year old three yeah mainly almost, almost always a lot of the a lot of hunters in Maine are also meat hunters. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, there's a bunch of them that say that they, if they, if it's not a big buck, they won't shoot it. But uh, most people shoot the first either, first legal deer that they see. And is it a one buck limit per hunter yes. for a season? Yeah. Okay. And and if you get a doe permit, that that's your deer. It's a mm -hmm. one deer, basically a one deer limit. That's the attraction of the archery seasons and the special regulation seasons is the, the archers get two, get two tags and if they kill two deer, when they register the second one, they'll give them another tag because we want to put the tags in the hands of the people that are best at killing deer. Right, Because we're, right. we're trying to reduce populations in some of those areas. And, Let's, um, an another thing we talked about earlier, and we were talking about does there, it got me thinking about um, the rut in Maine. And some questions we always get down south, you know, every year is, you know, um, what's the rut in my area? Um, is it going to change over time? And so there there's a lot of variation in the southeastern U.S., and there's a lot of reasons for that. Some of it's, we think, genetics from restocking, but also there's really, Joe, no... Uh, Mother Nature really doesn't have the selection for the optimal uh, parturition date or birthing date because we don't have these environmental um, issues like you have up here. And so the further you go north, in general, uh, the rut is going to be more and more synchronous because you've got to get a fawn on the ground at this particular time. So when you look forward, are they going to be big enough to make it through winter? So Given that, what generally is is the rut in Maine and winter fawns hitting the ground? A whole a whole bunch of research has shown that our puck our our rut peaks on November nineteenth, whenever that happens to fall. And mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of hunters will complain um, that the deer aren't rutting if we have a spell of warm weather, but uh, we know it's photo period. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's been proved. I, I told you the example earlier where we kept a bunch of, a herd of pen deer inside a building and controlled the daylight and had bucks starting to grow beautiful antlers in late November, early December. Um, so, um, and and our, our rut is pretty much a classic bell-shaped curve where mm -hmm. low, Low, fairly low in September, in October, uh, peaks in November, and we still have occasionally. Uh, we think if uh, 
if a female fawn is 80 pounds live weight that she can be bred and we have every year we see some of those the problem with that is seven months later um, the fawn gets dropped and then we still we, we have spotted fawns running around during October and November and that's you know that's too late and I don't I don't have much hopes for survival of a deer that's born um, that's bred and right or conceived in December and Maine it just mm -hmm. it's just too too they, difficult for yeah, them to Yeah, not enough it time through. for them to get yeah, big enough yeah. to, to live through that harsh so, winter. And, and a few get bred in October, and, and those are, you know, those are, you look and you think it's a yearling. It's with the right. doe and no spots, and you go, wow, that's a big deer. And I think those are the ones that the next year may get bred mm -hmm. um, for sure. But typically, yearlings do breed. Um, about 80% of our yearling does breed. Uh, Probably ninety nine percent of them have singletons that first year, and then after mm -hmm. the year that it's typically two. Right. I have seen four once in thirty years of. Uh, I probably in my whole career we used to collect road kills in the winter time and measure the fetuses to, you know, confirm or tweak that November nineteenth peak of the rut, um, and. Uh, I've done thousands of deer, and I've only seen one, one, one set of quadruplets and one set of triplets in all that time, and probably done two thousand deer. and And I've only seen the the, uh, the other side of that, which I find interesting, is I've only seen two uh, females that were collected in the winter time that it looked like the fetuses were in the process of being resorbed by the doe because she right. was in such poor physical condition. And I, I think a lot of people think it's a much much more common occurrence than that, but it really isn't, at least based on my experience. Well, that, that's very similar with us. The, the notion of the old barren doe is just not true. The, of, of course, there are going to be instances every now right. and again where something's wrong, disease, physiology, whatever. Um, but if she's in decent condition older she's going to have two fawns i had yeah. one that that uh, our uh, capital of new hampshire is concord and that's where my office was and we and the hunting pressure you know big population around there hunting pressure was intense we got a we got a roadkill doe one winter um and uh, the uh, obviously from tooth wear uh, she was really old and i pulled the tooth it was, she was so old, we really couldn't tell other than say really old. Pulled the tooth that she was 19 years old and she was carrying twin fawns. So, <laughs> well, that may be one of the best examples. That's probably, you, uh, probably a record for New Hampshire, but... Samantha you know. annuli? That's how you gauge yeah. 19? Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, we have the seven... Well, we, in Maine, we do them in-house. Mm -hmm. They go to the Fish and Wildlife Office in Bangor. And they... You know, they soften them and slice them and stain them and mm -hmm. quite a process. count the rings. Yeah, yeah. And it's pretty, it's pretty reliable. Uh, wear and replacement on to five and a half is, is I think is usually pretty reliable. I mean, and sometimes you say, does it really make a difference if a deer is four years old or five years old? It it makes a difference whether they're a yearling or a two and a half. I think in terms of our our population analysis and, and hunting regulations, but mm -hmm. once you get beyond that, you know, it just, and most states have gone to fawn, yearling, adult. Mm -hmm. That's all they need to, to run their harvest statistics. Uh, yeah, at, at a large scale, in terms of how is that population trending up or down or stable, you know, we, we're, we're a little more deer management fanatics in the South, so we're particular about age uh, to maturity and because we're always trying to, not everybody, uh, yeah. and, and for a lot of state wildlife agencies, this isn't as much of a priority for them, but for a lot of hunters, they want to see those bucks get to maturity. They want to see them to get to five, six years of age to maximize antler size. So, um, but, but in general, you're right, there's a that particular animal, I want to see it get to maturity, and then there's a general population dynamics with tooth wear replacement and aging. And You're really talking about 
two different types of management. That's you right. Know, it, you know, one, one is the, it, and the Quality Deer Management Association, it, you know, focuses on, you know, in getting individuals as prime as they can. And state agencies, you know, almost by default, have to manage populations over, you know, we have 30 wildlife management districts in Maine, and most of them are pretty big because we're mm-hmm. a pretty big state. And and the challenge in Maine, too, is is from north to south, or from south to north in Maine, it's about 500 miles, and people don't realize that. People people get to Portland, Maine, and they figure, well, uh, if I'm going to go to the northern part of the state, how long is it going to take me? I said, you've got a good, on the interstate going 70, you've got a good five-hour drive to get where you're going. And lots of days when I would work in northern Maine, I... I would spend five hours getting there. I'd meet the forester. I'd jump in with him. We'd go out and we'd look at a, at a, at a potential harvest that he was going to do, for two or three hours, and then I would go back and jump in my truck and five hours back home. And, and still be late older, at night getting as home. As I got older, I, I I got there and did the first part, but I I found a place to stay overnight, <laughs> and then I'd get up at crack of dawn the next day and drive back. But, yeah. Um, what about uh, predators in your neck of the woods up here? You're not in wolf territory. You're still a little far south. Yeah, for wolves. We've we've had we've had uh, three wolves, I guess, over the probably the last ten years that were confirmed as wolves. And uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service did the DNA for them. One was from Jackson Hole. One had Jackson Hole, Wyoming DNA. One had I forget where the other ones were. So we're we're pretty convinced that they were uh, captive pets and people got tired of feeding them 100 pounds of horse meat a week uh, because of the expense. So they yeah. they came to Maine, uh, had them in the back of a van or underneath the cap of a pickup a truck or some, uh, something and went up and one one was one was begging food at a campground. You know, walking around wow. amongst the picnics. It was still pretty shy, but it mm-hmm. was certainly not wolfy behavior. It was not a wild wolf and behavior. And somebody put a yeah. sandwich out, and he wouldn't take it out of their hand. And um, thank goodness. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, they'd put it over 20 feet away, and it would come slinking out of the woods and grab it and run back in the woods. And um, But, you know, we don't think there are naturally occurring wolves or mountain lions in Maine. The big, the big predator of deer... Uh, is is the coyote uh, sometimes deservedly and sometimes not deservedly? But the reason the deer are vulnerable is because they've got lousy winter habitat, so mm-hmm. that makes them more susceptible mm-hmm. to predation. And I think recently, with with both deer and moose, we've realized that our black we have the biggest black bear population, I think, in at least east of the Mississippi, and we think the black bears play a fairly significant role. Uh, they'll hang around places where, where there are uh, cow moose or or does doe mm-hmm. deer, and you know right at the right time of year, and they're just there all the time. I think they're just waiting for, mm-hmm. the, you know, the young to be dropped, and then they're gone. And so, is that in terms of uh, life cycle? Is that where you see the greatest predation is on the fawns? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Once they make it to an adult. Yeah, they're pretty vulnerable, uh, you know, till they get to, you know, six or eight months old. And then they can, our deer, in spite of the severe winter, I think we have pretty good fawn survival if it's a normal winter, mm-hmm. even if the doe is killed in the fall. Although that reduces their, yeah. their probability of surviving significantly without having the doe around to show them the ropes. But... Um, I think we're getting some main rain. Yeah, right it now. looks that way. That that was the forecast, and uh, hopefully, I'm glad it's today. Hopefully, it isn't like this tomorrow and and Tuesday. But what's the high temperature today for all my friends in Mississippi? Um, I'm guessing it's uh, in the fifties. <laughs> oh, we got somebody coming in the door here. That's yeah. okay. Well, I tell you. I'll tell you what, Joe, I know we have an appointment here. We've got to uh, we got to be at lunch here in five minutes, but I really appreciate you taking the time. It has been an absolute pleasure, and I know the listeners uh, are going to really enjoy hearing a different perspective. We talk a lot in the South. That's kind of where I'm 
where my home base is, so I'm certainly biased to talking about deer management down there, but it's great to hear another perspective from the Northeast. Well, thanks. So, this has been interesting, my first podcast. and That's right, your first podcast. I'm, one of my favorite sayings is, call me anything, but don't call me late for lunch. So. <laughs> okay, Joe. Thank you so much. You're welcome. We're glad you joined us today and hope you learned something valuable about deer management. If you have questions about this podcast or a question about a topic we haven't discussed, please log on to msudeerlab.com, click on the Deer University tab, and send us your questions. We'll get to them as soon as possible. In closing, we want to thank our employers, the Mississippi State University Extension Service and the Forest and Wildlife Research Center. We also want to thank the St. John and Dudley Hutchinson families for their endowments that support deer research and education.